welcome to The Generalist, where security practitioners come to look beyond niches, silos, egos, and to expand their professional comfort zones. My name is Ilya Omansky. This is episode seven, and so we're going to talk about uh, mentors and coaches. The title I chose for this episode is Respecting Mentors, but Advocating for Coaches. I'll explain, of course, but you can see that um, I think mentorship is extremely important for all of us. Um, and uh, I still have a mentor. Um, his name is Paul DiMatteis. And that gives you a great sense of um, what to do in your career, what resources are available, um, how to network, and so on. But I also feel like we don't understand enough about what coaching does to um, professional credibility, competence. So I got this idea from a great talk uh, from the Get Security Done team with Brian Allen, where they talked about uh, mentors and uh, how Brian's uh, career was influenced um, by a mentor. And what I think we all could also add to, um, to our careers is this duality, this, this uh, um, two representatives that will help carry us forward. It will help um, build our credibility and our competence. Uh, and that has to be uh, more equalized. Uh, because right now our industry um, really has a lot of momentum in terms of conversations about career progression, career development, how to structure it, where to get some resources. There's a, you know, a lot of teams, groups being organized uh, just to discuss that, that topic. But I also go back to this question of professional competence. Uh, as I've said in my previous episodes, um, it is sad to see that we are still being treated, being um, developed as a trade rather than a profession because we don't have academic standards, we don't have uh, research um, uh, that backs certain directions in our industry, certain application of controls and measures and also professional development. So I think that is where this question of um, being very careful about selecting mentors and also seeking out coaches uh, is so important. So let's set the parameters and feel free to agree or disagree with me. Um, I always welcome any feedback. A mentor is, like I said before, a person who can take a look at your current profile your aspirations and then talk to you and help you develop um, let's say a springboard and career progression by um, pointing you in the direction of the right let's say professional development uh, pointing you toward individuals in their networks who can further help you and also guide you to some degree a coach however will take a step back and say how competent are you as a practitioner in this field and they will ask a bunch of questions about your readiness to take the leap to take the next step to move forward as unfortunate as it is as i've said before it is still extremely difficult to select both coaches and mentors just simply because um, how do we assess who, who is a good mentor? Just simply because those people are well connected and can get you um, introduced to other people who can get you a job? Is that the qualification? Simply a person who can utter the words ASIS? Um, or SIA or other uh, industry associations and, the, and then say, okay, talk to people in this committee and so on to help you get involved in associations. Is that a mentor? 
um, a person who can uh, recommend for you, let's say, some resources, perhaps books to read, perhaps uh, courses to take, um, certifications to uh, attain. Is that a mentor? Um, we can pick any one of those qualifiers and say, yeah, that person um, qualifies as a mentor because they're helping progress, um, helping someone's career progress. And so I have to agree with that, although I would love for, for there to be a lot more structure um, within our profession um, for how we advise young and aspiring practitioners um, as they are building their careers. But the word coaching and the capability as a coach is also uh, subject to a lot of scrutiny, or should be subject to a lot of scrutiny, I should say. And the reason being is that a coach, unlike a mentor, really is applying their professional understanding of, um, um, in an industry, right, of how they practiced in the field, and they are assessing capabilities of a young and aspiring professional uh, in terms of whether they can stand to the test, uh, stand up to the test when um, presented with real scenarios, real situations related to helping those whom they advise, helping create solutions, solve problems. Coaches can look at people's behavior, so kind of soft skills, their communication skills, right? Um, they can look at their hard skills, something like writing, report preparation, right? Structure of, doc of a document. Uh, they can also look at the person's research skills. They can look at a person's knowledge of certain um, controls that could be applied in our industry to help solve certain problems, such as uh, understanding of technical security systems, right? So to what extent would uh, an individual who's seeking advice, seeking coaching, understands technical security systems or various other components of our, let's call it professional acumen, right? So coach looks at the person's performance and helps tweak minute or sometimes very obvious and very significant issues related to this person's performance in when when challenged with different problems when when they're in front of other people so i'll give you an example i had a young person um, who was coming from a very different industry and he aspired to join um, a consultancy like Kroll, Control Risks, Pinkerton, and so on. Um, and he was very interested in the field. He wanted to move from the, his current um, career track to the field of uh, investigations, asset protection, and uh, intelligence. So we had what would seem as a mentor-mentee uh, set of conversations about what the industry looks like, where are some of the entry points, what are some of the criteria for, for, for entry, where should person acquire some skills, and so on. So we had that, those conversations. At the same time, I was wearing a hat of a coach, and I asked this person to prepare a narrative on a topic. and. Uh, I said, just don't spend a whole lot of time, but I want to understand how you're able to conduct research um, that is uh, time sensitive and how you're able to be concise and produce a well-structured uh, um, research document. And I, we, we settled on a specific topic. This person sent me uh, in about five, six days, um, a six page document. The document had a cover page, and on that cover page, the title of the entire body of research of what he was supposed to do was completely different from the topic we had agreed on. So, 
let me take a step back and uh, share with you that I could have ended the conversation only at the mentor's level and said to this person, yeah, so these are the things to, um, to look at, some associations to join, uh, events to attend, some courses to take, and so on, and certifications to, to, to look at. But I would have made an assumption that this person is actually um, capable of operating um, as an analyst, let's say, as a researcher uh, in this industry, the p a position that he was aspiring to have, when I could see that the person's attention to detail failed on the cover page of that document. I didn't really care what else he had written because he missed our agreed topic completely. I also notice how people continue to create uh, resumes, which are very telling. Sometimes they have typos. Sometimes they have um, bad formatting mis mistakes. Um, sometimes the photo they choose to put on their resume uh, is, mm, let's call it, less than professional quality. Um, and it doesn't really um, highlight the person's um, good features in that photo. The lighting is off, the color of their shirt is, uh, is wrinkled, the tie is not uh, tied correctly, um, the posture is wrong, you know, maybe the, 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 the hairdo is, is off, whatever. So there are some many nuances that you can pick up on, um, but you would miss all of that if you were simply a mentor. If you're a coach, those are the things that you'd be paying attention to. So, why is it that in our industry the word mentor is so profound, so widely used, and so widely relied upon? Every young practitioner today says, oh, I'm looking for a mentor, or I found a mentor, and I'm working with a mentor, or practitioners that have spent many years in our industry are saying, oh, I have mentees and uh, I'm helping them progress in their careers. Please remember that as a mentor, you are still making an assumption about the person's cap real capability and about potentially some gaps in their actual skills, soft and hard skills. Just like the example that I just demonstrated to you about the person who simply didn't pay enough attention to detail. So, I believe that right now we are struggling with lack of understanding of the difference between what a mentor does and what a coach does. And we really should clear this up because a mentor can very well be a coach. It's not a problem, right? You can wear two hats, um, but you have to make an effort to do that. So the way I work with uh, some of the students that, I, that, that, I, um, that come to me and how I used to work with students when I w was teaching at John Jay was always wearing two hats. We'd always talk about what the industry had to offer, some of the entry points and criteria and so on, but we'd also talk about the skills. What do they look like? How can they be demonstrated? How could they be checked? And what gaps exist in those skills, right? Because I don't want to set the person up for failure by simply making introductions for them, then them getting a job and failing at it. If I haven't really paid attention to how skillful they are, how competent they are in certain areas of our, um, uh, our industry. And so I feel that we have a bit of an issue both on, uh, on the side of experienced practitioners who become mentors. And we also have a lot of overconfidence on the part of young and aspiring practitioners who are seeking mentors but believe that they know a whole lot about how to actually execute protection of assets, right? No matter what niche within protection, protection of assets they would occupy, they actually have a very high um, confidence in their ability, which sometimes goes unchecked. And sometimes it's the person's lack of um, proofreading ability, right? That they can't, they can't uh, fix the typos in their document, right? Sometimes it's the way they wear their clothing when they're supposed to be in front of a client. It's their posture, it's their gestures, it's the way they assess how to apply controls to certain um, 
problems that exist on client side, right? Or they become too focused on, let's say, operational things simply because they don't understand anything about technology. Or they, on the, on the opposite side, talk about technology a lot without understanding strategy, without, without understanding um, how operations work. So I think that's one of the reasons why we hear the word mentor very often, because there's a lot of people who are very, very kind and very happy to be mentors. And that's great. There are also many people, young and aspiring professionals, who need mentors. And that's also great. But neither community understands that we really, as a, if we want to be called a profession, we really need to start paying much closer attention to the actual competence of people who are seeking to further their careers, right? If I call myself a security practitioner, right, I better then be, be ready to talk about the entire spectrum of what our profession entails, from the camp of cyber to the camp of physical, and then many, many details within each, so that I can demonstrate my competence when presented with complex problems, because these problems are not getting any easier. If anything, they're becoming much more complex. If you think that a video surveillance system just is its own control, please think again, because any camera today is IP addressable. It's connected by a single power of, over Ethernet cable uh, that, that uh, also carries a signal that if the IP address and the camera is not manufactured right or doesn't have the right protection controls on, on it as a, as, a, as a piece of hardware, a piece of technology, then it can be compromised and thereby compromise the network on which it sits. Okay, so we are living in a far more interconnected and complex world to just say, I want to be an intelligence analyst and that therefore I am a practitioner. Therefore, I am competent in, in the security industry. That's not the case. If we are going to continue to be in niches, right, it is very likely that we'll be misadvising, misguiding our clients. So, that's the message to both those who want to be mentors or are mentors today and those um, who are seeking mentors. Really, what you also should be thinking about is how to get coaching into this conversation. How to understand what competencies to build, how to build them because of the likely exposure um, with, to different problems that you're going to have to uh, have to solve, right? Our industry, unfortunately, doesn't help with that because there are multiple groups that are carrying on with different conversations. And yes, it's very convenient, very comfortable to, to, to utter the word mentor, 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 mentee, mentee. And that's great, but that's just noise at the end of the day because how do we know the quality within, with, with which each of those mentors, and I will put them in air quotes, each of those mentors is delivering advice to their mentee. Is that quality advice? How do we know? Our industry doesn't have standards, doesn't have um, any foundations to actually guide both a mentor and a mentee to success, to consistent success. Otherwise, what I see happening is people uh, providing advice to young and aspiring practitioners uh, and giving them, actually exacerbating their overconfidence and telling them, oh yeah, you, you're, you're good, you'd be good for, let's say, an intelligence analyst position, or let's say, if you go into, um, uh, let's say, product manufacturing uh, or uh, integration um, community. And uh, you'd be, uh, let's say, uh, good for, for that. But they're also arming them with the false belief that they are security practitioners. So that's not correct because those people don't learn the full spectrum of what security is and what controls exist and what problems exist and how complex the problems are, as I said before. 
So, uh, unfortunately, our industry and its various associations still um, don't offer a consistent base for us to develop good mentors that can take a person through the whole spectrum and warn them about um, how, you know, how competence is built, what expectations exist, and how to be ever so careful to project competence and uh, expertise to clients without really having learned um, certain skills, having acquired certain knowledge about um, how wide our industry is and what kind of uh, skills you need to have. So how can we do better? Well, we should probably learn from other professions. Um, other professions um, have established um, their academic base. So a mentor, in a sense, could say, oh, okay, so if you want to progress in this career, this is the education you should be seeking. Uh, and these are some additional um, types of training that you should also look at because they help make you uh, a, a better uh, asset to organizations, a more attractive talent. But we don't have any of that. So other professions like law, as I said before, medicine, engineering, architecture, there I can understand that a mentor right, is probably uh, working within certain parameters because they understand uh, what good uh, academic uh, institutions to point uh, aspiring people to, what other training exists, uh, what is acceptable, what kind of um, roles are out there, and how, what are the criteria for those roles, um, because that's far more straightforward. So we can learn from other professions. I, sus I think it's important for young and aspiring professionals to also remember that mentors are great. Okay? They give you reassurance, they give you confidence, they help you connect with more and more uh, practitioners in an industry, point you in the direction of different resources, but you also have to scrutinize who is advising you. You also have to think about, okay, is this person guiding me in the right direction? What kind of a background has this person had and how does it compare to the industry and the types of problems that are, um, that are arising, that are ever so more uh, complex? And so, as young practitioners think about that, it's very important to also ask themselves a question. What do I know? How can I solve a complex problem? Okay, take a look at some of the case scenarios, case studies that are arising uh, within our industry where people are uh, talking about this blend of physical and cyber challenges that are now living inside a single problem, right? Where an incident has occurred, it had um, its origins in the physical domain, but then it uh, slowly or quickly transitioned into the cyber domain, or vice versa, okay? So what kind of competence do you have to be able to solve those types of complex problems? And so what you can start asking is who can coach me, who can look at the way I perform and really tweak minute and also some more obvious um, ways in which I operate and which I perform uh, just the same way as a sports coach would be looking at performance of a single player and tell them every time you hit a ball let's say on the field, um, you are twisting your leg a little bit more to the left than you should. That's how minute that the type of advice should be. For example, in our professional, uh, on our pro professional side, uh, you could look at the way people write, right? If a person puts the same word into, the, into a single sentence, right? That doesn't really look v very good to the reader when you're, when you're using the same word m multiple times or at least twice in a sentence, right? That's a minute thing, right? You, most readers would probably not notice it, but if you want the report to look professional, you should understand the, the styles of writing. You should understand um, how uh, to 
proofread your work, not only in terms of grammatical mistakes, but also in terms of style, in terms of um, how to bolster the message, um, how to make your language more professional, more aligned with the expectations of, uh, of the reader. And so that is where a coach could play a significant part and help uh, young and aspiring professionals uh, I, I use this word interchangeably with practitioners at, the, at this point, I apologize. How a coach can help um, move this person's career forward by giving them assurance, not just in terms of what's available to them, but assurance in terms of their own competence so that they could feel more comfortable when they have to speak with others, but potential clients of theirs, potential hiring managers about how competent they are and what they can deliver to solve um, clients' problems. I can point you to a single video. Uh, it's a TED talk by a person named Atul Gawande. Uh, and I will try to provide a link for it um, in this, uh, as this video is, is released. In that talk, Mr. Gawande offers probably the clearest advocacy for the role of a coach. He talks about a violinist, a world-renowned violinist, whose wife sits in the audience and constantly gives him feedback after every single performance. She tells him that his shoulder is off or that he's uh, um, perhaps been a bit too fast with uh, playing uh, some notes um, or perhaps that he's not breathing well enough. Um, how Atul, Mr. Gawande himself, uh, after several years of thinking that he's reached the peak of his game, was um, in front of uh, a more senior um, colleague who told him that he gets coaching advice from another individual, and he in turn um, gave some advice to, uh, to Mr. Gawande and how he started believing that coaching never stops and that coaching really helps refine somebody's competence, somebody's level of execution uh, uh, for problem solving. So I also want to share with you that we will still have a challenge um, with moving toward this better balance between men mentorship and coaching uh, because our industry is still catching up. It's still trying to develop more academic foundations, more research foundations, which can then set parameters, much better parameters for mentors and coaches to help uh, advise and, uh, and lead the young and aspiring practitioners. But the most important challenge that I think we all have, and I keep repeating this time and time again, is humility. It's simple. If you're not humble enough to constantly think that you're not all that, that you are actually continuing to learn and build your competence, build your credibility day to day, and to refine the way you um, do your work and to continue to expand your professional comfort zone and to look for um, coaching and for resources to learn about things in our industry and beyond that you may not have known, right? To constantly uh, be hungry for learning about how other parts of our industry work. For example, I would expect that the next generation would be completely comfortable on both the cyber domain and physical domain with, for its entirety, so that those domains would, would have no need to exist in vacuum. Okay, so this is where I would want uh, young and aspiring practitioners to pay attention um, is to their own humility and to not only seek guidance of mentors that can make connections for them and possibly get them a job or get, get them into kind of higher and higher circles in our industry, but to also continually check and recheck their own level of competence and ability to execute. So 
I leave you with these thoughts. Thank you so much. Please stay safe. And I look forward to receiving your feedback. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.